Hi everybody, I'm Oliver, this is Chaotic People File, and I have COVID. Uh, it's 2023 and I got COVID. It's, it was mild, it was mostly just exhaustion, I was a baby napping for most of the day for like three days and now i'm at the tail end of my isolation period i'm going to start testing again tomorrow i'm excited to be out in the world clearly i am seeing the repercussions of self-isolation because i don't know what day it is most of the time what time it is most of the time and i am so chatty i've replied to so many messages i had a cold with my dad and now i'm filming this video and i'm like i i can't stop i need the human interaction <laughs> anyways uh today i am going to wrap up the books that i read in december plus some of the books that i read in november that are children's books so we'll do it like this i'll tell you about the books that i read in december that made it to my top 20 reads of 2022 which will be linked down below and in the i as always because that will be quicker then we'll move on to the children's books that i read in november and december i know most of you will probably not care, but maybe you need recommendations for young readers in your life or people you're hoping to turn into young readers. So I thought it might be helpful. And then I'll just talk about the rest of the books. So let's start with books that made it to the hall of honor, to the top of the top. All right, so first up, Angels in America by Tony Kushner. This is a wonderful queer play about Joseph, who is a closeted Mormon, and he goes to work at the federal court, I think it is. His boss is an evil douchebag called Ray, who is also not closeted per se, but yeah, also has a weird relationship to his sexuality. It's also about his wife, Harper, who is also a Mormon woman, and she's such an interesting character. I felt really bad when I didn't mention her in the top reads because she was so essential. She and Pryor, who is another character I'll talk about in a second, are my two favorite characters, and the characters I immediately latched onto, like, root for and love and care for. The other part of the story is Louis and Pryor. They used to be a couple, but Pryor gets HIV and goes to hospital and Louis abandons him and then gets involved with Joe. It is wonderful. It is so out there. Even now, it feels daring and fresh and full of great monologues. It um, has a lot of interesting sort of defamiliarization, alienation techniques, such as like same actors playing different characters in ways that are quite clever. And it's just a brilliant, brilliant, beautiful, moving work. Then Someone Who Will Love You In All Your Damaged Glory by Raphael Bob Waxberg. I never know when to say Waxberg, but I think it's Waxberg, right? Nevertheless, these are amazing short stories. There are so many of them in this. Well, it is kind of longish for a short story collection maybe, but like it, it is just normally sized and it has so many stories. All of them are great. I don't think there was any that I didn't love. And in case you don't know, this is by the creator of Bojack Horseman and it has that same sensibility. It's all about the modern everyday condition, but approaching it from these very both extremely relatable and sort of common rhythms but out of left field at the same time so again it's not the same stories as Bojack Horseman but it's the same artistic sensibility and so if you need more of that you should check this out 100% cannot miss finally Homie by Dana Smith uh, which I also uh, ranked really really high actually this was I think my third favorite. It was just so good. It's just, uh, the great thing about this collection is that you can both hear it and see it. So it is one of those cases where every single aspect of each piece feels deliberate 
and thought out and works and it's very effective however it doesn't read tortured at all the metaphors are so organic and everything flows and it's oh, such a pleasure to read it's also very very heartbreaking it deals quite a lot with racism homophobia loss grief suicide so there are a lot of trigger warnings to be dealt with here. However, because it's so raw and vulnerable, it's never played for shock factor. Nothing here is just to shock or to shock in an empty way. It's just using language to its full sensorial effect. All right, so now a roundup of the children's books that I read. First, we have I Am Henry Finch by Alexis Deacon with Vivian Schwartz, a very funny existential sort of kids book, very minimalist, would recommend for perhaps like an older kid because it can be quite sparse. Similarly, Ergo, Alexis Deacon and Vivian Schwartz, similar aesthetics, very much about individuality and identity and oh, I love it. Meanwhile, Back on Earth by Oliver Jeffers, it's a beautiful, beautiful exploration of conflict and scale but also connection and it's quite deep children taking a trip with their dad and seeing how far in time and space they go it's really interesting it is also for like an older kid maybe the art is beautiful it's something that will arise a lot of questions i think then what do you see when you look at a tree by emma carlisle really really beautiful it's big format it's good to you know start teaching ecology and i think it's a book that will transition well for different ages it's very beautiful one that everyone needs to have it's grandpa's camper by harry woodgate it's about this little girl whose granddad is telling her about i don't know if they got married but like about his boyfriend or like long-term partner and all the adventures that they used to go on such a good story because it's of course great queer rep but also this idea of adventure and sort of memories and sharing and i think that one is good for everyone just like timid by harry woodgate harry woodgate is my hero um, this is about a kid who has a lion and is very shy about the lion. So like the lion can stand for many things, but it's basically about being shy and not being able to express yourself. And I, ironically, from someone who came out really recently, I never had that problem. I was always a very outgoing, outspoken kid. Shyness was never part of my problem. But I think it's really important to make them comfortable with situations where actually perhaps like performing would be really fun and liberating for kids and like addressing why or where that shyness come from. Similarly, Weirdo by Zadie Smith and Nick Laird with Magenta Fox. I think Magenta Fox is the illustrator. This was so cute. It was just completely adorable. Well, it's about this tiny hamster who likes to do karate and the hamster arrives to this new house that has a lot of pets and at first the pets make fun of the hamster but then it gets better so it's really cute this is one that i handsel a lot i think it appeals regardless of what the kid likes it's good for like different ages the illustrations are absolutely stunning and like will appeal to virtually everyone it also feels so not gendered in a way that is amazing because one of the hardest things about recommending books for children especially is that sometimes people are very gendered in what they want for the children and i think this one is a very good sort of quote-unquote gender neutral option oh and i also read super tato the great eggscape i had never read super tato by pauline and suhendra it's very cute i like all the puns so if you know a kid who like enjoys language and enjoys finding clever puns i think they'll like this a lot this is what my job has turned me into <laughs> and finally this is not for children but i still want to tell you about it is the diary of edward the hamster 1990 to 1990 this is a hilarious book um it's like really small it's a booklet about this brooding hamster who spends his days thinking what the meaning of life is and then he gets a companion who is a savage and then he gets another companion who he falls in love with and it has pictures it's very grim it's very depressing it's hilarious they have this whole gimmick of this being a found journal and the authors being the translators it's it's just 
a romp and I really enjoyed it. Okay, let's go with graphic narratives now. I have four to tell you about. First, Kisses for Jed by Joris Bass Backer, a coming of gender story. This is quite famous um, in the sort of trans graphic novel circles and I didn't like it at all. It's so directionless in a way that it's not even plotless, it's just unfocused. By the end of the story, it's not clear whether Jed is... like, they are transmasculine in a way, but you don't really know if they even arrived at an identity or not, although they do go to a gender doctor and the way this is depicted is quite flippant. So even then, like, the graphic novel stance on this is, is quite unclear. It's this thing where, like, you try to talk about the 90s or even possibly the 80s. I think this is the 90s, actually, yeah. This affectation and everything was boring and we didn't have technology. Like, I can't remember anything that happens because nothing happens in a way that, like, I love stories where, quote-unquote, nothing happens, but those stories still have significance, have a core. This nothing is explored. Like, it's all style, no substance. Even the gender issues are not really explored. And I love the art style, which pisses me off even more. I don't know, the way this was constructed or plotted or brought together, like, how, how? Even if you wanted to do this as, like, an episodic narrative, there are no episodes. For half of the graphic novel, it is not even about Jet. It's so diffuse and just vibes in a way that it's not saying anything. I'm sorry, like, no one can convince me otherwise. I also read the first volume of What Did You Eat Yesterday by Fumi Yoshinaga, and this is a quite cute slice of life story about this gay couple in Tokyo. I enjoyed sort of the mundane aspects of it. There is definitely not a lot of LGBT plus manga rep that is like that. The fact that these are also adults that know their identities and have their own lives, that was pretty nice. However, the pacing is really, really off. A lot of time is spent cooking and it's clear the author has such a strong relationship with food and wanted to provide the recipes and stuff like that. That's great, but it's not very fun to see in a manga format. I have a friend who really loves the live action and I can totally imagine how this would work better in a live action because a lot of the scenes would have more fleshing out in the live action and at the same time the scenes that come across as boring here, which are the cooking stuff, would pop in a visual medium and would have, you know, nice music and nice, like, voiceover. So I am not going to continue on with this series, but I am glad I read it because I've had my eye on it for a long time. And it is quite cute. And there are certain episodes like being out or not at work that are interesting. However, I think there are better depictions of LGBT plus life in Japan nowadays. Now let's move on to something that I have actually seen quite a lot now, um, apparently because it's like a new arrival and I just found it like right before it became a thing. This is To Strip the Flesh by Otto Toda. So this is a collection of short stories. The first two stories are about this character over here, who is a trans man. When I found out that there was honest to God trans manga, I was so happy. <laughs> of course, cross-dressing and gender bending are common themes in yaoi and yuri and stuff like that. And I don't even oppose to bad rep in that way because I understand manga has a very specific cultural context and so I try to judge it on its own terms, right? But lately I've been dipping my toes into queer manga made by and for queer people and it's been in this case, I think the author is non-binary or they experimented sort of feelings of dysphoria for a long time. They are definitely queer and uh, they did do extra research. There is a Q&A at the end about sort of trans stuff uh, in particular in Japan. And it's just sort of really fascinating. The art is beautiful and the story here is about this guy who is the son of a butcher and his father really wants him to get married 
which of course is a bit of a problem. It starts pre-transition and it follows sort of his transition and the second story is like a little bit afterwards and we see how his life has changed. He is not fully out, but like out to himself. He knows who he is from the beginning of this story. And like literally I think the first panel is like Chiaki Okawa is a man and here he does butchering videos on YouTube. So it's quite interesting how it talks about like masculinity and ideas of the flesh and stuff like that. It has quite striking imagery. And the rest of the stories are very weird. Some of them are very wholesome. All of them are very emotionally impactful. There is this one story about how a son that is very ungrateful to his mother starts feeling the emotions of the mother and it's very very hard hitting that is the strip of the flesh i really recommend it if you like sort of odd off kilter manga and want to read some short stories not get into like a new series very good and finally for this section i have boys run the riot by keito gaku this is the first volume i have since read the second so i will wrap that up in my january wrap up Possibly I will also wrap up the third and fourth volumes. This is about a trans guy in school. He just about realized it, I think, at the beginning. And here we see how he navigates being in a school where everyone knows him by his dead name and like being treated the way he wants to be treated comfortably. There is this new guy who comes to the school who is sort of seen as a failure because he is repeating a year and he looks very much older. It's so interesting to see because in Western media, this character would be portrayed as a bit of a bad boy and everyone would be like, ooh, cool. But here everyone rejects him because he's not normal. And so this whole thing revolves around ideas of normalcy and conformity, which if you know Japanese literature, it's like a big theme. And that's fascinating. So it is, of course, mostly about transness, but it also dives into other types of nonconformity, and they decide to start a clothing brand and that is the main idea um it's just so so well done the mangaka is trans himself and the translator is non-binary and they have a q a at the end and it's amazing so i just really recommend it if you are into sort of slice of life or contemporary urban manga if you like for example ayasawa that sort of thing Oh my god, you cannot go wrong. It's so fun. And the art style is like so modern, but in quite a fresh, beautiful way. Like I can see sort of the old and the new coming together in this. I really like the size, the format. I, I love this book so much. That's Boys Run the Riot. Let's continue with more queer stuff. I have no regrets or apologies. This is Gender Fox, a collection by Jem Henderson, Jonathan Kinsman, and J.P. Seabright. It is more hit and miss than collections that are by one poet. There were poems here that I adored though, and so I would urge you to pick it up. A lot of them were super well done. A lot of them, if not perhaps like that, greatly accomplished were still really interesting i love the ideas i love the experimentation there's a lot of play here with form there are lots of layers of metaphors and language yeah i really really liked it there is this one poem called etc which is i think by jpc bride yeah it was by jpc bride when i read that poem i was just in Oh. And that was interesting as well because um, the poems are credited at the end, so like they appeared without any sort of context um, of who had written them, but at the end you can find who wrote what. That makes it really interesting because I could tell a lot of the times, oh this feels like a poem by this person. And that is always great when you find that they have such strong individual voices that you can tell them apart even though you don't know who did what. I think that's a total win. All right, pausing the gay just for a second, Inside the Bone Box by Anthony Ferner. This book has been through a lot. This little book is uh, from the Fairlight Moderns collection, which I'm obsessed with. I want so many of them. I own one more, but I just am obsessed. I love them so much and I want all of them, probably. This is about an obese doctor and his anorexic wife. It is about desire, about gender politics, about health, 
and obesity. I think it is very interesting. I would not recommend it if you are struggling with any of these things. Because I think the book is quite ambiguous in its stakes. Like, it shows the cruelty towards obese people. And it doesn't condone fat shaming at all. It does not show that this doctor is a worse person because he's fat. But he does definitely get treated worse. However, because of the ending, I think it could be construed as a book saying that losing weight could be a valid answer to solving these problems. I would have to reread it also. I sort of binged the first half and then had to put it down for other reasons. I think it's because I didn't finish it before Nonfiction November. I then returned to it in December. I think that's what happened. But it's quite ambiguous and it explores these themes very explicitly and Again, it's not grotesque or anything, but it also does have some descriptions of medical stuff. If you are squeamish about that, you might not like it. I thought it was fascinating, especially because outside of internalized fat phobia of women, mostly, there are not a lot of explorations of weight in fiction or like especially fatness in fiction and it's great to see it's, it was a really interesting book and I really liked it the writing was great it was really fascinating it has alternating chapters for the wife and the husband I would reread it I think it was really interesting I need to revisit the ending especially but yeah I, I it was really interesting Inside the Bone Box by Anthony Ferner a book that almost made it to my top reads was The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs by Steve Brusatti. This was so good. It was really, really great. This was literally number 21. This is a book about how the dinosaurs became the reigning species on Earth at a certain point in time and how they went extinct. But even more so than that, it's about paleontology and how we know what happens, how scientists devise experiments, how scientists sometimes thought one thing and then they thought another one, how they find the fossils, how they evaluate the fossils, how they study them, the type of experiments they can devise, dating techniques and all of those things. It is fascinating. It is so well written, so engaging. One of those perfect blends of science writing and memoir and survey of a field. He's so passionate. He knows what's going on. It's really, really good. What I will say though is that it is not a book that will explain the different dinosaurs categories it's much more of a large contextual look but if you want to dive into each species of dinosaurs and their characteristics then there are other books that do that more this does go into some details especially with particular species when necessary but it's much more about paleontology and paleontology's understanding of the time and the conditions in which dinosaurs lived that is why it's titled The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. I think that is a good caveat, but I, like, it's not that the book doesn't deliver on what it promises. Is it like, maybe this is your second dinosaur book and your first one can be, I don't know, Dinopedia or something like that. Still super recommended. Even if you are not that into dinosaurs, but you are into academia and understanding scientific fields and how they operate, this is a good one for that as well. And let's go back to gay stuff. Yay, I have um, two books that are both novels and your story collections at once. The first one is A Hundred Boyfriends by Brontes Purmonel. This is a very loose romp through San Francisco and the dating slash hookup gay culture there. It's very, very explicit in a very saucy but still like well constructed way. It is one of those books that doesn't hang together very well. It's very polyphonic. It's very sort of sketches of life. But it worked so well for me because I loved his voice. I do want to read his novels that are more explicitly like novels that follow like this one character and has sort of more of a plot. This, although it does have rhythms and the end definitely feels like the end, it doesn't just feel like, oh, stuff happened and it ended. You do see a progression, you do see an evolution in the way these vignettes are arranged. However, there are lots of different subjectivities and voices. It feels more like a bit of a fever dream, but in a, again, in a very fun way. And actually, the nest Smith blurbed this and said, I love this slut of a book. If that doesn't make you want to pick this up, nothing that I say will. And finally, I have Shyam Selvadurai's 
Funny Boy, which is a book that I've been meaning to read for years. Ash got it for me and I'm very thankful because it is such a beautiful book. It is interconnected short stories about this boy who is just so charming from the beginning and it's so interesting to see him grow, although you only see him until he is like a teen. It's such a worthwhile journey. It starts with the story about how he likes to play Bright Bright, where he dresses in a sari and I think one of his sisters plays with the boys and then all his cousins play the bridesmaids and one of them plays the husband. One day he gets found out and that's where the title comes from because he keeps being referred to as a funny boy and the idea of like being a funny boy meaning queer right it's just such an interesting depiction of queerness and family and the political stuff going on in the background. This is set in Sri Lanka. You don't need a lot of background. Actually, I, I didn't have a lot of, if any, <laughs> and yet I still like understood what was at stake. So that is really effective. The writing is beautiful. You really see a progression, a shift from sort of the child subjectivity and then the teenager subjectivity. The first love and ideas of gender and how gender intersects with sexuality and how often from gendered behaviors, people people assume sexuality is fascinating. Family and sort of what family members the child is close to versus not. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's also heartbreaking, but like in quite a heartwarming way, actually. I really recommend it. It's, it's really, really nice. That was another one that almost made my top of the year, but you know, you have to make hard choices. And that was it. This is everything that I read that I hadn't wrapped up. This is not true. I think I... I think I have one thing missing. Wait. I lied to you. I have um, three things that I haven't uh, wrapped up uh, yet. So one is The Gender Accelerationist Manifesto by Lila Monster, Vicky Storm, and Amy Flores. This is exactly what it sounds like. It is really interesting because it is very short, but a very powerful manifesto for radical revolution. Like their analysis, actually, especially how they give very, very solid material-based arguments in favor of gender self-determination, basically. Um, it was really interesting. Um, I was also lent this by Ash. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, it's because you haven't seen the A Little Life Tag, and you should, it's really fun. Then I listened to two audiobooks. One was a memoir by Mohsin Saidi, A Dutiful Boy. I forget if he's like Indian British or he grew up in India and then moved to Britain for studies. I think that was the case actually. He became a barrister and uh, it's a standard memoir to be honest, but it was interesting. The especially interesting stuff was to deal with shame and trauma and how the silencing breeds trauma, like just the idea of having the secret um, prompts trauma and how he dealt with that through therapy was really interesting. It is decently written, like it's nothing special, it's a good memoir, it was really nice to listen to, it is read by the author, so really heartfelt. However, if you saw my Top Reads video, you know that my favorite book of last year was a memoir and it just changed the way I read memoirs now. And then the actual final book is William Shakespeare, The World as Stage by Bill Bryson. This I actually loved. I love how Bill Bryson reads and I knew I would like it because I've listened to podcasts with him as a guest and he's always delightful. He's so funny. He's so well-spoken. This is about Shakespeare. It's a bit of a survey of all this Shakespeare scholarship in order to try and craft a truthful as possible interpretation. And I think it's actually really useful. I think if you're going to read one Shakespeare biography and you're not interested in like literary analysis, you just want to know who Shakespeare was, this is a book you should read. It's very well written and engaging and easy to read, but also contrasts other theories in a way that's like very quick, but you get the gist, you get the political and social climate at the time. And yeah, it, it's a, just a really good biography. There was little that I didn't know already, having, again, studied Shakespeare. It was not like surprising, but that's a, even more to recommend the book. I loved it, even though 
I knew so much of it. Because again, like the comparison stuff, the setting of the scene, the narration, it was all really good. I recommend it both as a book and as an audiobook. And that was it. I always tell myself that I'm going to be more concise and I never make it. I only have myself to blame. I think in my January wrap up, I will do my TBR update. But for now, this is all because I am getting tired and I still need to go and uh, make progress in a course that I'm taking. So while I go do that, why don't you tell me what have you been reading lately? What have you been enjoying or hating? Is your 2023 off to a good start? And yeah, have you read any of these books? Do you want to read them after hearing me talk about them? Any and all comments are welcome down below. That's all. See you next time. You know that my top book was a memoir and uh, what have you been reading? Re uh,